Welcome, and we are live. Welcome everyone to our CTF live stream session for the Cloud Native Security Con North America. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the CTF challenges so far, and we have two sessions and a set of great speakers and, and fabulous co-hosts that will join me today uh, for a session of some Q&A, some questions and answers, and then we'll go through um, the, some of the CTF challenges. Okay, so let me introduce you the co-hosts for uh, this first session. Um, welcome, Alyssa Miller and Gab Smash. Hello, it's great to be here. Hey Hello. there, good to see you. Good to see everybody. Awesome, great. And uh, the floor is yours. I'll let you run the show. I'll be here as backup if needed. <laughs> Good deal. Awesome. So do we want to bring in our guests? We have a couple awesome guests today, Gab. We do, yeah. So who do we want to pick first? Uh, so can we just start bringing them in? Because I want to make sure we get the names right. But I know we got Allie's hanging out out there. And there's Mark has joined us. Yes, so, we have Mark Manning here. Anders has joined. I mean, check this out. Okay, Andy's popping in, and Lewis is here. Yes, this is Lewis. <laughs> I this love it. This is the real Lewis, not the fake Lewis. And I can be both. <laughs> well, it's exciting. So, I don't know. Do we want to round the horn this thing and see what's going on with y'all? I think you should probably introduce yourselves. If we start, maybe we'll just start next to me, this side there. I can do this. Hey, Mark. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Tell us about uh, yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm Mark. I'm a security jerk. I'm a, a person with an InfoSec background. Uh, I used to work for NCC Group, doing a lot of source code reviews, doing a lot of Kubernetes security stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm getting into a lot more cloud lately. And now I work for Snowflake as a security architect. So that's my background. Nice, nice. We can, uh, Anders next. Yeah, uh, I'm Anders. I work as a developer advocate uh, for Styra, which is the creators of the Open Policy Agent project, or OPA, which I'm going to refer to for the next <laughs> for the next hour or so. Uh, yeah, I, I come from a background in identity uh, primarily. So I worked for the last three years or so in uh, with OPA and access control. And before that, uh, it was all about identity, uh, identity of workloads, identity of users uh, and clients and, and so on. So a lot of OAuth, OpenID Connect, uh, so kind of came uh, as a natural next step. Like once you established identity, like what do you use that for? Like, or, and, uh, and, and uh, so I got into authorization and, and uh, yeah, here I am. That's awesome. I have, I have former DevRel myself, so I have a special place in my heart for the dev advocates, you know, love it, love it. So Ali, tell us about you. Yeah, hi. I'm also a developer relations engineer and developer advocate. I work at New Relic and um, I specifically focus in security and making security more digestible for beginners and newbies. Um, and I actually live stream here on Twitch. So if you want to follow me on Twitch, I'm at Ending with Ali, um, and where I do a lot of learning in public of teaching myself security. Most of my practical knowledge I've actually learned live here on Twitch. So I do a lot of different lessons and education um, on Twitch. So. We need more people like you in the industry for sure. Yeah. All right, Andy, do you wanna go next? Hello, hello, I'm Andy. Um, I'm a founder and CEO at Control Plane where we do cloud native security stuff. Um, I'm a little bit dev, a little bit of ops, a little bit of security in there as well. Um, very proud to say I've just, uh, just finished writing a book. Shout out to Mark, for some uh, awesome review work there as well. And, uh, and of course, to Lewis, <laughs> who's over there, and James, who were both instrumental in making that thing more polished, fixing the bug bounties up, all that kind of good stuff. Um, I'm a SANS instructor as well, SANS SEC584, again, um, with the uh, more than capable, yes, this is Lewis, 
uh, aiding and abetting uh, in that. And uh, yeah, like a, a zealous CTF um, maker and player and enjoyer. So yeah, super pleased to be here and uh, really looking forward to today. Congrats on the book. You'll have to drop the title for us so we can get it. Oh, okay. It's called Hacking Kubernetes, perhaps predictably. Perfect. That is a very straightforward title. I love it. <laughs> I have no idea what it's about. Yeah, it's I, impossible I know. to tell, isn't it? Boy, it's and ambiguity. Yeah, I, I suppose one more thing is like I'm super stoked as well. I, I'm actually at KubeCon in person. So uh, yeah, this, this is the conference center wall. Keep it contained for the moment. Um, so yeah, if, if you need me to go and like high five anybody or like respectfully uh, wave at them from a distance, I'm your man. I mean, there's a few. If you can find Ian and Cat Cosgrove, you know those two. They they might you you might know them. I, just maybe, <laughs> just maybe. It was contained yeah. an intentional pun because I like it if it was. Yes. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well done. Well done. So Lewis, other than editing books for Andy, I'm betting there's probably a little more you do. Um, I help select uh, covers for books, um, so I'm very proud to say that the book has got a duck on it. So I think that's a highlight of my year, possibly the last 10 years, to be honest. Um, and I'm not in KubeCon, I'm back at home in Wales, which is, uh, well, England is the sidecar of Wales, but hey, I'll deal with that next week. Um, yeah, so day to day within Control Plane, I do lots of training. Um, I used to go to lots of different places, but I pretty much give training in here now, so this is my little training dungeon no no it's 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 lovely it's been great like it's we've had to change our ways over the last uh, however many months and it's i just gotta meet lots of people i gotta help them out and um it's super awesome and i get i i'm gonna point that one and point that one i get to work with these uh every day and it's phenomenal they've really helped me push my career and um super awesome people and thank you for having me um don't follow me on the internet there's nothing that interesting to find um yeah that's pretty much it I'm calling you. No, no, this is not Lewis from now on. I should change my name to that. It'll be that would exciting. Be perfect. Absolutely. So James right. is hanging out with us too, and James seems like he doesn't necessarily want to admit association with Lewis and Andy, but you know, we'll, we'll see. James, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm a security engineer at Control Plane with these two. Uh, and I sort of deliver security consulting -y type services uh, for these guys. Um, I was previously a security consultant, so it's uh, it's uh, very much my my wheelhouse when I'm not uh, helping Andy with books or help building uh, these awesome CTFs. So, as people love the CTF, they should thank you. Is which I what I just heard. <sighs> Well, there's, there's, a, there's a huge team of us um, at, at Control Plane that have uh, all put in uh, lots of effort. So I'd, I'd be wrong in um, just saying it was me, but um, it's been a lot of fun contributing to it. I, anything I like positive you. goes his way. Anything positive his way, oh. anything that's not so great, I'm here for that. So. <laughs> all the hate mail goes to Lewis. I got a special oh, service for it. <laughs> it's not the first time. <laughs> We'll put his email in chat, make sure you all know where to send that stuff. But <laughs> So Andy Andy mentioned the, the cloud native security stuff. So I'm curious how you guys got into cloud native security, right? I mean, what does it even mean to say cloud native security? I mean, I think everybody kind of has their own idea of what cloud native is and then, okay, on that, top of that we put security and then sometimes on top of that we put cloud native application security and then there's going to be cloud application security brokers i don't know it, it <laughs> keeps going right but how did you guys get here i mean ali let's start with you how, how did you get involved in this area of the yeah world? um so i'm i was thinking about the right way to say this i'm going to reverse age myself i'm going to baby myself in a way because to me, it's only been cloud. Oh There's God. never been on-prem. So when I, it, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Like I'm baby, I know. Um, so I to me, so old. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I'm making myself 
be baby. But to me, like whenever I like am doing anything, it's always been cloud first. So to me, it, it, they are synonymous. It's I am now actually learning more about how it used to be done back then as I dive more into Kubernetes and how servers were are, are still somewhere in the world still being hosted. Um, but to me, it's always been cloud first. And I've always had an interest in security. And I've always had an interest. I've always thought people who work in security are the smartest people in the world and people that I've always looked up to, like Alyssa and Gabby. I follow you both on Twitter. <laughs> Fangirling just a little bit. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but um, I've always thought people that work in security were such amazing people and just thought in such a different way. And so I was like, how can I learn to be like that? And to me, that first step was figuring out just how everything works from a security aspect to a technical aspect. I feel like security is a great way to learn just bits and bobs of everything. So that's how I ended up here. So for the record, I am now following you on Twitter. Yeah, I need to do that. I need to make sure I am too. I'm Even worst. though it doesn't say that you're following me. So I'm, you're, I'm, I, I'm on lists. I'm on lists. So oh, you're, no. okay. you're both on the security <laughs> list. I can definitely understand that. I just give you a hard time. But. <laughs> there we go. Yay. Cool. So uh, let, uh, I'm not going to say it that way. That would be cruel. Um, so Anders, I'm, I'm guessing that you, like me, probably didn't start in cloud native, but I could be wrong. So correct me. No, you're definitely right. Uh, I remember my first job as a developer uh, when we were when we were done coding, we would we would deploy our uh, code to a USB stick and we would walk uh, across the office building to the operations people who would then take that and and actually install it on our servers. So yeah, that's so I'm I'm that many years old. <laughs> Sneaker so, so How did you end up in a cloud native world after that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think. Eventually, that that same organization where I, I stayed for a couple of years, they they eventually understood that things had to change. There was like that whole uh, gap between development and operations was it just wasn't a, a viable model. Uh, and of course, so uh, like slowly, but but still, we try to adopt like DevOps practices, try to to be more agile. And and so on, and and then eventually I, I ended up working more in identity systems, and of course in those like those standards stay around for something like twenty years. So so once you learn something like OAuth, you can you can kind of work on that for the next decade or two. But uh, yeah, and and then. Coming into authorization and O or an OPA, where it's, there's there's really no standards and there's uh, really a lot of ideas on, on how to best do that. That was that was kind of a shock for me coming from from the identity world, where there's all these like very strict boundaries on uh, on what you're allowed to do and not do. So yeah, and and uh, to answer like how how I got involved in. In the cloud native space, I guess is is through OPA, which is of course uh, one of the graduated projects in the CNCF. Awesome, and, and props to that organization for creating the antithesis to DevOps at like extreme to extreme levels. I I mean, talk about creating silos. That is amazing. <laughs> USB sticks to deploy. I. I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> Gabby, have you ever worked in an organization that did that? No. <laughs> nope. Think of no. think of the security though. There's so many. There's no way your USB stick is going to get hacked in that 40 <laughs> yards it takes to you know upload it to the other server. It's, I mean, you you're, 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 you're up in the moving for your time. <laughs> All right. So who wants to go next? How did we get into cloud? Cloud native. We have Portnet Mike. Oh, is it? Oh, is it just? <laughs> Hi. I think Mark's being volunteered. Yeah, <laughs> Mark's being volunteered. That's fine. Um, I think, let's see, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard to go like, you know, Ali's saying she's a baby, so I want to go all the way back and like, describe myself as like a, 
great great grandfather of technology or something. But I was I was uh, a pen tester doing network penetration stuff and when virtualization was just starting. So it was kind of like that was the first revolution that I saw in the industry, and somehow I migrated to an application security background doing um, Android and mobile stuff. And, and I swear I'm going to get to like where we get to cloud native because it doesn't make any sense how these are related yet. Um, but I saw um, Android and iOS that were doing like these sandboxed processes. They were doing like isolated kind of container you know, processes. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And when containers started becoming adopted, Kubernetes was around. I was like, this is this is the future of all servers. We're going to have like containerized processes. We're going to be isolated. So I started adapting um, what I was doing for like application security stuff and looking more towards what is Kubernetes doing. Like, let's help secure this thing. And and of course, that didn't really flesh out as I wanted it to. This you know, we don't have we don't have full sandboxes per se, but we've got some level of isolation. It's cool. Um, so I, I think I was just pushed into cloud. I had a whole bunch of customers and it was just the industry's moving to cloud. Like who's, who's doing on-prem stuff. In fact, earlier on in my career, I was flying everywhere because everything was on-prem. I had to go to like data centers and I had to go to physical you know, servers and stuff. And then it just stopped. You say, oh, no, it's, it's all remote. We'll just give you a shell. You know, we'll just give you access to things you need. So I had customers that were just in the cloud. You need to adapt or die right in the, in the security yeah. industry. So. I was doing a lot of uh, Kubernetes stuff, and I built a team uh, at NCC Group that was just doing containers and sandboxes and, and Kubernetes security assessments, and we kind of built uh, built some staff around that. So, so now here I am working with Snowflake, and they're uh, like a cloud company and full cloud native. We don't we don't have anything on prem. We can't even imagine what an on prem server would be at this point. So, so here I am. I fell into it. Mark, that was kind of like a choose your own adventure novel. <laughs> yeah, it was exciting, right? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it's exciting for me and I'm, I'm living in it, yeah. It's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting the way that it, I mean, some of the stories already just like it sort of happened, <laughs> you know? It's crazy how some, uh, that seems to be like the way of things with tech careers, but Eddie, how'd you end up here? That is a fine question. Um, I was very privileged in that my first job out of uni, um, I ended up doing something that I was perhaps underqualified for at the time. So there was a small startup in Bristol, which is uh, out on the on the west coast of, uh, of England, close to Lewis, Lewis's proximity, and uh, it was it was a software as a service back when that was actually a, a, a definition of something, um, business to business management system. I was the first employee, so I had the in incredibly fortuitous position of doing operations, doing the development, doing PCI compliance back when uh, back when we still stored numbers for people. That very quickly uh, failed to be the case, and um, everything was rack space. So so everything was like you, you were you were buying space in a colo. Um, at that point, you weren't actually stacking them, and racking them yourself, but still renting servers. Uh -oh. Uh oh, I think he, just he does this occasionally. He he, <laughs> he, he he does this just freeze frame for a moment just to get us all on our toes. <laughs> go on, Andy, you got us again, mate. Hysterically, I was saying we had availability issues and then everything <laughs> froze. So there's some sort of resonant inductive, inductive coupling with silicon. I'll have to be careful what I say. And um, yeah, so, so Amazon opened uh, EU West One in like, someone will probably call me out, 2008, maybe. And, uh, and and we just jumped on it. So, going from going from that position where I'm just kind of the de facto, this thing needs to be done. There's a cloud over there. Why don't you try and unify our approach to uh, uh, the way we're delivering services? And 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 that was it. Kind of steamrolled from there. And then after that role, I uh, I started to be a consultant. And I just found that regulated industries had more interesting problems. And everything in engineering is a compromise, and often it's trying to like fit something into a fit something into a shape that doesn't really natural fit. And uh, yeah, slowly escalating through uh, through different organisations, and then finally, sort of cloud native turns up, and everything just makes sense. You can kind of take 
the big multi-tenanted Linux system, squeeze it into a microcosm and then run or bin pack them kind of ad infinitum. And uh, it was pretty clear from sort of early, early musings with Docker that there were lots of security opportunities. And uh, yeah, it's just all kind of steamrolled from there. So yeah, again, like very fortunate to have that, that luxury. And I often wonder if people like joining, joining the train or like getting on the ride at this point, what must it be like to have all these foundational layers before you even get to the containers and Kubernetes at the top, so go all the way down through. So uh, yeah, big up Ali doing it all in public, definitely the best way to learn. Yeah, it, there's there's a lot there's a lot that I'm I'm it, there's so much that I feel like I'm always learning and it's as especially as I've been digging more into Kubernetes it's just been like so much to break down and just be like oh yeah like this is this is how it's done and this is like why I feel like I've been like missing in my education as I am continuously learning so yeah yeah it's a super nice thing that kind of at some point for me, like I learned so many different concepts and suddenly they just all seem to kind of amalgamate and make sense and I could cross reference. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly it's just like perseverance and making mistakes is how I learn. Yeah. You mentioned the regulatory environments. I think uh, <laughs> Gabby and I can both kind of identify with that. Uh, me from the financials and Gabby and her industry. Yeah. I. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we love regulations. Yeah. But cloud's been good. Cloud yeah. helps us address some of those regulations, things like data localization and all that fun stuff. Yeah. So, Lewis, how did you end up? You're, you're with Andy now. You're doing this cloud native thing. Did he just kind of like drag you kicking and screaming or was this voluntary? Oh, uh, I, I don't know what I'm allowed to say on that point. Um, I think we're exclusive. I, I am just with Control Plane now, and it's uh, I'm not anywhere else. It's with Control Plane, but uh, yeah, no, my career it's um, it's been varied. You can look on LinkedIn, and if you can figure it all out as how I got there, congratulations. I don't have a clue. Please tell me. But uh, the main point for me was about five, six years ago now. I just hit this like lull in my career where I was a developer. Um, I got into it of a love of developing. I just I. For me, it's puzzles. Everything that I see is a case of how do I fix this? How do I how do I make this? How do I solve that problem? And I got into this position where I wasn't solving any problems whatsoever. And um, and it was last Sunday. It was World Mental Health Day. And at the time, I was also suffering from depression, which I wasn't aware of because it was a biological thing. Um, but it, it absolutely sucked. And so, but then having to solve my depression made me realize it was like I like solving problems. So I kind of jacked in my career of, of being a developer. And then it was like, what's interesting? And at the same time, I was starting a family and then containers. And it was like, stop, stop with containers. That's that's going to help me because I need to be like, I'm going to have a child and they're going to be screaming in the night. I can't work till like 4 a.m. So um, I started that way. But then, and for me, it's always conferences as well. It's events like this. You get to meet people who are like-minded. Sometimes you you feel like you're in a bit of a hole on your own and no one else can really understand you. Then you bump into all these amazing people in these conferences and you're like, oh, no, actually, we're, we're kind of alike. It's kind of okay. It's a nice place. Um, and so from that, I saw Andy on stage hacking containers and it was just like, hello, this is, <laughs> hello. What? Security always scared me because I never felt like it was a defined line that I could achieve. Whereas actually, then I realized this is the perfect puzzle for me because it's something that's constantly evolving. It's always something which I can work further on. And so from that point, I've worked my, my something off to get to this position where I could work within Control Plane. And it's a peers that I get to work with. So I've already, like, you know, Andy, and you're going to hear more about James. But we've got some other people behind the scenes as well helping us today, which I need to mention, such as Michael, Steve, and Carl. And every day, you just have, like, phenomenal people who just try to make you a better person. And it isn't just Korea, it's about being a better person as well. And so that's just what we do. And um, yeah, so probably in a year's time, I guess I'll still be in this kind of branded top, but that's where I am. And I just think I found that's the main thing I just say to people is just like whatever position you're in, especially with a CTF, and that's that's a puzzle that we've made for you. It might feel tough at times, but don't worry because it is supposed to be really tough and we're here to help. But at least by the end of the day, you're going to learn another way as to how to break something, which is always fun. We do like breaking things. All right, to finish off that trifecta, I guess, James, you're the last one. Hello. So uh, yeah, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I sort of started, started my career off as a security consultant. 
Um, so I guess I was quite fortunate, I think, to have that as my um, first sort of grad job. Because um, I, I don't think I appreciated it when I applied for it at the time, but it exposed me to a huge variety of orgs and environments and ways some places do things, some places do things badly, some places do things well. Um, and sort of early, early in my career, it was invaluable really because it sort of it, it exposed me to all those all those different things that perhaps would have taken me many more years to, um, to to witness and learn from had had it been like a normal um, job cycling scenario. Um, I, I sort of started off in, I guess, what you might call a more traditional security kind of. Uh, penetration testing thing where I was looking at like Windows and Linux boxes and maybe a bit of mobile here and sort of you're expected to sort of know a little bit of everything and um, yeah and also sort of largely based in those on-premise environments and the, the more as, as sort of um, the, the years went on in that role this 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 newfangled thing called cloud or probably not so newfangled by the time I was looking at it, but um, more and more places were using it. And um, I guess it, it, it appealed to me, um, just I think partly due to the elegance. But um, yeah, I became uh, part of the team that looked at looked after a lot of the cloud and especially the containerization um, element of, of those bits and pieces and just their exposure of looking at how different orgs uh, built things in different ways and how they screwed things up in different ways, <laughs> I think really is how I learned. Um, and then sort of fast forward a little bit to today at Control Plane where I sort of um, still to a degree look at various orgs and how they screw things up, <laughs> um, but also sort of uh, giving back that advice and um, contributing to, yeah, to their, uh, to their security postures. Awesome. Those are some insightful answers. I think it's really interesting how everyone's kind of got a different, a really wildly different career path, but we all end up in the same industry. So um, I mean, a few of you mentioned that you really enjoy working on the CTFs and also solving CTFs. So, my question for you is, if you could use one tool and one tool only to do a Kubernetes CTF, what would that be? Bash. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was waiting for that answer, but come on, we can get more creative than that. I know, right? I mean, that was the answer I was going to say. It was just terminal. Just <laughs> terminal. <laughs> That's hacking right there, because then you get everything. You got to be more creative. Gonna, Play with the API. I bring up crew. Right, like the the plugins for KubeCuddle, like Crew, have a bunch of like scripts that are baking in that. Like to me, is kind of like the metasploit of Kubernetes, where it's just got a bunch of scripts that they aren't necessarily like new things you got to compile and build. They're just these dependencies you can yank into your to your box really quickly and start attacking different stuff. I like that the metasploit of Kubernetes. <laughs> DJ Yuffie says they would use Splunk. I saw oh. that. Interesting. Um, other thoughts? I mean, because I, I kind of, you know, I, I knew we were going to kind of go into this path and I was thinking about it myself. And I, I mean, kind of along the same lines, Mark, but I was just thinking like Perl, like, you know, I'd be out yeah. there. I mean, my thought was just, yeah, how do I, you know, probe and abuse the API? Because I mean, that would have been my first thought. So, but yes, yeah. I did also think about the console. Well, I think Andy's right. Or is it like everyone's saying bash because that's, you don't know the environment you're going to get. Are you going to get remote code execution? What kind of shell? What kind of environment are you in? Like, what if it's Windows? Like everything's out the window. You don't know what to do. Uh, so I think like the core Unix tools, running netstat, LSOF, you know, like bash. What, what can you do? Like the find command, running strings. <laughs> like these are all simple tools that are on most boxes, but they're so important for these CTS. So... Is that like a statement on like the types of issues that people have 
typically in their cloud native environments? Or I mean, what are your thoughts? Is that because I, I feel like, okay, if I'm going to go hack a web app, you know, this probably burp suite or something like that is going to be like the universal tool everybody says they want, right? But when it comes to you know things like a, a case cluster, we don't really have like that that tool set that necessarily stands out, other than yeah the the terminal window. So, does, do you think that that kind of says something about common mistakes that people make? From my perspective, yeah. I mean, we are not dropping O days on people, right? We are we are exploiting misconfigurations. We are we are taking bash scripts and weaponizing them. We, we're just doing kind of script kitty stuff because that's that's what we're targeting. And that's that's the most common configuration problems that, that we see in cloud environments. It's not, you know, I'm not going into Amazon and uh, having some crazy vulnerability that I've just been sitting on, you know, for the past two years in these, in these engagements. It's, it's like, let's, let's write some tools to speed up, you know, uh, common misconfigurations and stuff like that. I wonder what other people think. It also shows just how new this all is, because having a tool like Burp Suite, web apps have been around from day one. So a tool like Burp Suite has come out of it that allows for that extrapolation and easier interpretation of data and information you get. Um, but with how new um, cloud native is, and even a tool like Kubernetes, um, you don't have that uh, that time period to be able to create an extrapolation because if things are moving so fast that you just have to keep pushing forward you don't have that break point where you can just be like oh yeah like i can actually build something around this but i just have to keep going and figure out what's wrong um and you're going to do it on the one thing you know as we all said bash terminal command line yeah i think Alyssa mentioned it before just like the idea that things need to be statically compiled and maybe we can curl bash them down into the pods when we're exploiting stuff. Like, like we're not loading up Burp Suite and jars and Metasploit interpreters like for, in, into a pod. Like we don't, we probably don't have the time, and we probably don't have like the execution environment to do that. I'm kind of curious for Andy's thoughts because I mean, Andy, you like literally wrote the book on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose yes. Uh, it, it actually goes to print today, so um, it doesn't exist for another month or so. But uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's a really strong point. We, we're not searching for vulnerabilities in the code base itself. Generally, um, there are huge buzzing projects going on um, against Kubernetes, which kind of deal, deal with that for us. Um, obviously, because it's a purely declarative system, then there's best practice is easy to statically analyze. And, and we've got a lot of tooling, and this makes the whole pipeline story and sort of defensive DevOps build out um, really effective. But then as a kind of emergent property of that, there's so much complexity in the number of permutations that we can have set up that even though we can statically analyze for like a known good baseline on various different parts of the system, it becomes misconfiguration, as, as Mark said. And just the interplay between two things that are not correctly configured, maybe that's on a kind of per namespace basis, Maybe that's the way that the cluster sits in the sort of wider topology of the cloud account. Because, I mean, the, there's something in Kubernetes docs, which is like the, the four C's of, of Kubernetes. You've got the code, the container, the cluster, and the cloud. I think that's right. And um, we, we model the application is already compromised because we say, if the application is compromised. What about the topology and the network policy around it? What about the node isolation? What about the services and the workload identity that that can hit up in the cloud? And the, all those things kind of inform how the architecture is built. So, so the question there becomes like, not only do we have misconfigurations in, in the file system, can we escalate to root really easily within the pod? And then all the container breakouts generally require root or cap um, or some capabilities. So that's, that's kind of the first line of defense. Is the security context hard enough? Um, then again, assuming that that's broken out of what identities can be integrated within the cloud based upon what the service account has to some extent again you can statically analyze um, for those kind of things but then of course if somebody can just exploit um, like a metadata api in security where you can hit your cloud provider's metadata api pull back the instance role with like a old school well an old school uh, token service and then just escalate to the cloud account 
well, you can just go and image all the disks, and it doesn't really matter about your, your configuration of the cluster itself. So having everything declarative is super useful, but then the way that we kind of work our way out and around those, it is just a standard set of tools that we want to... Uh, the difficulty is, is doing it contextually and understanding the developer's intent and trying to figure out where the, where the holes would be rather than just um, kind of like spraying scans across the whole thing. But uh, yes, a meandering way of saying I agree. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. So um, I, as someone who's never done a Kubernetes CTF, I'm super curious, how would you go about solving this CTF challenge? So without giving too much away, where would you start and what would you look for first? That's an excellent question. Um, it, it kind of depends. Um, speaking generically, like old school enumeration and discovery techniques are still completely relevant. Cloud Native doesn't throw away uh, the baby with the bathwater kind of thing. It just brings in some other abstractions and allows us a more fine-grained model to hang policy around processes, basically. So um, I, I love Nmap, actually. I suppose that's another tool with a, a decent scripting engine to it as well. Um, so yeah, like starting off with an Nmap enumeration is often a useful thing to do against cluster. In, in this case, in the first thing we're going into, there is... Um, there's some application level uh, injection that, that we've got to play with. Again, uh, as Ali says, like it's been around since the dawn of time. This is the way that stuff gets pwned. Remote code execution, first in the door, and then what's my privilege? Can I escalate? Can I enumerate? Can I attack the visible horizon? Um, all that good stuff. So I haven't really said anything there, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so why don't we take this? This seems like the perfect segue into we're actually going to do one of the live one of the challenges live here. So, James, I think is that you that's taking control here. Yeah, I haven't heard James yet, though. So if you could just check his mic, otherwise I will speak on behalf. Yes, of it James is. Too. It absolutely oh, okay. is. Apologies for that. <laughs> thank, thank. I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> James, just really quickly, if you can increase the size of your terminal, it seems like you're opening a bigger one. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I'm just uh, prepping a couple of windows. So whilst you prep that, just for today's <laughs> CTF, if you are looking for a cluster, if you could DM the Taskmaster, Taskmaster has a load of clusters ready to go that they're on the other side of that door over there. We'll send them across your way. Um, if you need any help, reach out to Goose. Um, other than that, just make some noise on the channel. Someone will find you soon enough, and we'll definitely be there to help you out. And Lewis, if someone who's watching now wants to get started, um, where should they go? So you need to sign up for the security days, and then you should have had an email with credentials. So for today, that's where they need to go. Um, we will promote this at the end. There's an open source version of Simulator where we've already got scenarios out there. And then if you are interested in this, well, we're always running game days anyway. And for us, it's always just about let, letting people in and just playing about. So if you are interested, just reach out to us. Um, Again, I, I, did, I put myself down on the internet there, but you can find me on the internet. I've got a double barrel surname. There's only one of me, which is a terrible, terrible thing for me. But um, you can find me, just message me, and I'm always more than happy to help out. On Twitter or on Slack? On Twitter, yeah, you can get me on Twitter, you can get me on Slack. Um, I'll put all my details in Slack as well later on today. So. But drop again, them in the drop them in the chat also so people can I'll, I'll do them yeah i'll do it okay it's but... my twitch streamer i'm sorry i'm trying to get everyone information i'm it's bringing me out i'm trying to get answers <laughs> i'm just going to let you down of nothing there's no interest in my stream <laughs> anyway we don't we, it's just a contact just a contact i i know okay cool. we'll take this offline Ali. we'll we'll discuss it <laughs> it's okay cool so, so hopefully sorry Alex. I, I was going to say, we, we've got a theme um, permeating the, the CTF today. The conference is in, in LA, and uh, so we have a Hollywood theme going through. And, uh, and the first, first film from which we have taken inspiration is Inside Out. And uh, yes, more will become apparent. Uh, over to you, James. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so we can see uh, in front of us, we have the memory CI/CD build system, which is the entry point to our first challenge today. 
Um, I'm hoping you can all see my screen and it's blown up enough, um, but just shout if you can't, and I'll blow up a little bit more. <clears throat> so um, we've got two sort of web pages that are exposed here. Uh, and the reason we sort of started through a web application is we wanted to simulate a little bit more realistically um, how, how an attacker might gain access to uh, to a container or um, might exploit an application. So if we explore the web pages available, we can see we have a status page, which just tells us some information about the about the system. Oops, sorry, it's uh, just just uh, just tells it's down. Nothing too interesting at the moment. Then we can also see we have like a utilities diagnostic page. So of interest, initially, we can see this ping box, which if any of you have any kind of uh, hack the box or traditional like CTF experience, you might recognize this as a, a potential command injection issue. So what I'm going to do is open my uh, network tools in Firefox, just so I'm uh, recording network traffic. And let's have a look at what happens if I try and use the functionality just legitimately. Can you zoom in your screen, please? Yeah, yes. Not sure if uh... uh, looks like it resets every time I refresh. That's a little annoying. So we can see through entering an IP address here, we have the output of the ping utility. Does anyone from the room want to hazard a bit of a guess at um, what's happening here? I'd say it looks like my web development's come out of retirement for a couple of days. And um, I think there's something that we could do with this potentially. I'd be inclined to, agree, inclined to agree with you, Lewis. So what I'm going to do next is copy. So uh, in my in my network tab, uh, I can see this is the most recent post request. Apologies if it's a bit small. I think I can blow this bit up. Um, I'm just going to copy the request out as curl. So that'll allow me to uh, over on the other side here. Hopefully. Even if there's loads of junk in here, this is this will be the authentication token. But essentially, we have the same request that we made when we press the submit button in the web application on the left hand side. So if we hit enter, we hopefully get the same result. Excellent. This proves we can duplicate what we were doing in the terminal. So hopefully. In the stream, you can see the last part of this command, or last part of this curl request, sorry. Looks a little bit suspicious. So we're seeing uh, there's a JavaScript function. I should note that that it's appending ping-c3, and then the, the assumedly the input, which is an IP variable, right? So starting to think about how can I break out of that? How can I change the IP to something more fun? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So not only can we specify the IP, because we're passing that, C, that dash C3, that looks like we're passing the whole command in as the request. So if we try that again, but we can edit, say, 
get rid of all of that and maybe just say if we try replacing it with ID, we'll see that we can specify the whole command here, which is great news for us. So we have a command injection, command execution floor in this website. We can see that we're running as the Nginx user. So that kind of tracks, given that we potentially might be using Nginx to serve our website over on the left here. So the next thing I'm going to do is throw a reverse shell. This is, might be more familiar to some of the uh, sort of classical pen testers or security folk amongst you. Um, so this is where we will be uh, connecting a bash shell to an IP under our control. So for this purpose, uh, I'm using a service called ngrok. And what this does is it allows us to uh, basically listen on a public IP on the internet um, and get that connection proxied back to our local machine. So the command I'm going to use to do that is going to be netcat in the container here. So I should say there's a, there are a few different ways to, to achieve this. Um, for example, we don't, without doing a little bit of further enumeration, we might we don't know that we might not have the netcat binary installed in the container. But for sake of argument, we'll, ass we'll assume we know that. Um, so. Oh. So we can run a command that looks a little bit like this, and then talks to our ngrok endpoint. Which is the following. Ah, interesting. So getting a, a DNS error here. So this indicates that there might be a DNS problem in the cluster. So we can work around that by resolving the ngrok URL to its IP address, and then using that in the command. Cool. Whilst you're doing that, James, then I'll just mention as well that, like, if you've done our CTF challenges before, we usually just jump straight into shell. And so this time around, we wanted you to have to do it this way to say, like, well, we haven't given you credentials to start with. Um, the next couple of scenarios, you've got credentials, but we're just trying to show you this is how it can start. So if you're always wondering, well, is, is, as an attacker, someone sends me credentials, it isn't the case. It's That's what we wanted to show with the start of this. So back on our ngrok screen, we can see that we've got the ngrok tunnel spun up. And in this middle panel here, we have our reverse shell. And to prove it's alive. So this is essentially the same command we run before. But now we have a reverse shell, which gives us a little bit more flexibility. So I'm now going to start trying enumerating around the cluster to see, see what kind of container it is, uh, see what's available to us. So, so we're, this... we're, inside of a, we're inside of a pod, right? We can do anything that we want here. What are some other like tactics that other, other people are interested in exploring here? What would, you, what would you do when you first get into a pod? Hmm. Being British, I'd wipe my feet first and take my shoes off before I go into someone else's pod. Um, so one of our favorites is um, Am I Contained by Jesse Frizzell. Um, if you can get that, if you can get that running, it shows you a lot of what you can do from that point. So big shout out to Jesse as ever from, uh, I'm pretty much, it's, it's just what Andy would say anyway. So I'm just saying what Andy would say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Consummately done. Definitely. Well, Lee, sorry. sorry from chat says cap sh dash print. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
So, okay. so, that, so what that is, is uh, it's going to be listing all the capabilities that are available to the pod, implying that, okay, maybe there's some overprivileged uh, access to this pod. Can I break out of the container? How, what, what can I possibly leverage? So I think mm -hmm. that's a good call. Also, Jay Beal says, am I contained? It'd be a good check too. So this will live, as you say, will list us our current set of capabilities. A wild pop appeared. Which you may recognize as the default set of Docker capabilities. So no privileged container. So there's not a trivial breakout. Hmm. So we got a couple of links at... floating around. Or, no, go. I was going to say uh, uh, the mounts. I'd like to see what volumes are mounted inside the container. Mm -hmm. That's a good shot. So. I think we've been mean, and we don't have the mount binary. <laughs> Ooh. So but, now we start looking at like the proc file system and saying, mm -hmm. can we get the information from the mount command without running mount? We got yeah. a request for another zoom. Is it possible to get a zoom in, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, trying to maximize without wrapping too much, but hopefully that's a little bit better. Definitely. Cool. So yeah, that's a, that's a good suggestion on the proc file system. So we could look at proc one mounts, and this will give us a good indication of what's mounted in the system. There's our favorite path, uh, run secrets Kubernetes service account. Mm -hmm. Come back to that later, maybe. Is anything else standing out? What was the movie again that we're basing this one on? Emotional status seems a bit un Linuxy. <laughs> Inside out. Emotional oh, okay. status is a really great call out there. Looks sus. Definitely sus. All right, so. Let's mm. <laughs> That's just kinda <laughs> That's aggressive. Well, it's lucky we went for inside out rather than seven because that would just be atrocious right now. So um, at least we did that. Hmm. As you say, not very Kubernetes y. And a bit weird. Well, these are terrible negative feelings. So I automatically want to replace them with something positive and happy. after a little bit of sadness though. So if you were to search for movie inside out, you'd see the core characters. Cool, and so what do we reckon? Sorry, Les? I was just gonna save the searching on IMDB quickly. I was just gonna mention the other characters that were potentially missing. And I say there's any big inside out fans on this, um, but uh, we've got sadness and joy missing from these emotions. OK. So what do you reckon we should do about it? Well, if they're missing, maybe we should find them. OK. What do you reckon? In other files, or? Maybe. <laughs> um, someone <laughs> in chat says, 
find or add, it's JBL says find or add kubectl, see if there's a service account token and run secrets. Okay. Let's have a look. Jay's taking us in another direction. I like it. <laughs> well, we can always come back to the uh, old emotional status at another I point if we need to. Just grep for sad. I feel like that's, yeah, I feel like that would be fruitful. Okay. Well, there is a right there. Wait, where do you think we should grab? Slash. Yeah, it's just everything. <laughs> <laughs> we could stay here for a little bit. All right. How long is this thing? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, we got like three minutes left. So maybe know. maybe under slash run. Take a while with that one. I, I'm, I'm going to save us the weight on that one and uh, tell you it's not going to come back with anything. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's good Fair to enough. know. But we also see it also says emotional status here. Okay. Well, I suggest we maybe follow what Jay was saying and um, have a look at kubectl. Yeah. So, uh, okay. so as probably no surprise given the earlier mount entry, we can see that we've got a service account mounted in. So we could try and talk to the Cube API server with it. So just to make you aware, James, we've got about five minutes left. And oh, okay. we don't even, we've got like one minute left. So we've got one minute left. I was going to ask oh, you wow, to okay. kind of uh, tie it up here and. Yeah, we can absolutely just run through the rest of it if that's. Um... Yep. Cool. So if we, yeah, if we use the uh, service account token and the DNS address of the Kubernetes API server. Uh, verify that we can talk to the API server like so. So we might then want to start poking around a little bit, maybe get pods, for example. which reveals that we have a limited service account. But it does tell us the namespace and the name of the service account. You can run can I and who can. Mm -hmm. I do just the secrets. Don't look to the so, mm -hmm. so for example, we could do Something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, need the uh, redirect stutter. See, we can't get secrets. So we could, if we had a little more time, maybe download something like RecS, which would allow us, which is a um, crew plugin. Well, at the it was just a standalone binary beforehand, but allow us to enumerate through the access, the API calls that we were allowed to allowed to run, um, and which ones we weren't. But we might also realize that, given that the emotional status was mounted on under var run, there might be some form of config map that we're able to look at. Yeah, JB will just put in chat to look at config maps. Uh huh. So we can. And lo and behold, we can see there are there is a config map. So let's jump into it. Dash O YAML. So let's have a little look at what it is. Ah, looks familiar. Mm. 
So the next step is we might want to update that to something that has the values we want in it. So as Lewis mentioned, there's another couple of um, another couple of, uh, of emotions in the movie. Lewis, you remind me what those are, please. Sad? For you, James, certainly. Oh, Ali, you go. I just know one sad. I <laughs> know. So, um, and you need to see the movie. It's a great movie. Sadness and joy. I know. <laughs> I need to see the movie. Cool. So, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, move into a temp directory. And then paste in a pre um, pre written YAML file with the, with the um, with the new emotions in them. Then, if we look at the YAML file, we can see that ah oh, yes, that's the full range that are in the movie. And so we can look at if we can apply those. Cool. So that looks like it was successful. If we now go back to And give it a minute, it might update. So, incidentally, with this config map, why couldn't we have just appended to it? Why couldn't we have just appended sadness and joy to the file? I'm going to assume it's mounted read only. Right. Swing and a hit. Now, if we go and look at the build status, we might notice that it has changed. And the system believes or is happy with the config that we've provided it. And potentially has given us a bit of a hint as to what might have happened next. Sockets make me hope that there is some kind of local socket, Unix socket, exposed somehow in the pod now. Let's have a look. So if we look at, uh, where are we? So in our testing, it sometimes takes a minute for the sockets to align properly. Because of course, the CI system is never instant. Oh, are you gonna be passing the Docker socket into this path right now? Potentially. That would be cool, <laughs> cool or exciting. <laughs> Yeah, so the concept of this scenario with Inside Out was that in the movie, and without giving too many spoilers, the memories are changed and altered, uh, causing different effects to happen. And so within this scenario, you've had to go in and change the memories accordingly, which is then causing change and effect to happen within the cluster, which is allowing us to go on to that next level there. So within a couple of minutes, we might see that within Fire Run. I mean, we could also monitor uh, our friend prop one mounts. Button type.
do we need to drop this connection potentially and see because when we set up initially we could rerun that to potentially spin up into another pod or anything to mm -hmm. that effect so i believe it'll kill our connection for us but as is the uh, as the demo gods appear to be against us perhaps we will have to force it so i can just respin up my netcat connection through rerunning the uh is Nginx doing the actual socket opening? Does it need to be reloaded from the configuration? Like if you nope. kill Nginx, it'll kill the pod, but it, can you? So there is a, in, in the back end, there is a deployment modification. So it waits for the uh, Kubernetes deployment to be redeployed. Which, so we're waiting on, uh, waiting on Kubernetes scheduler. And controller at this stage. <laughs> There's some good chat in the chat right now. Um, ah. Lord <laughs> Fool. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Eureka is best. Um, yeah, Blog Fool has pointed out that they reverse engineered the status.php page to identify what these things were, which is which is a great shout. And um, there's a question. Does pods have, do pods have a concept of host name or bash history? Well, yes, if they're baked in, if somebody's gone and done something dynamic at build time, but once the pod restarts, then no, that's ephemeral and it's lost. Mm -hmm. So we can, wow. So Docker is in this pod next to your Nginx service. Is that what this is? We, we, uh, yes. So Docker CLI is installed. Very but, uh, e e Equally you could curl it from somewhere, given this part has internet access. So if we run this command, we'll see that we can talk to the host Docker daemon. I would say, uh, which... uh, yeah, just a reference to anybody, essentially BOTB, like the uh, uh, static binary go line tool uh, can interface with the Docker socket too, and do a bunch of these breakouts. So if you didn't want a full Docker binary to interface with it, you could use BOTB. Okay. So unfortunately, I got bad news because this has been awesome. And I know uh, all our viewers are really enjoying it too, but we do have to wrap up. Um, so lots more to be learned, obviously. Um, James, thank you for running through this. I And thank you, everybody, for all the, the great suggestions, the ideas. And it's it's cool, too, to see you know in the CTF how maybe there's different ways to go about finding some of the same information. And same as when you're you know pen testing something like this or you know, trying to define those volumes in your own environment. So, uh, but yeah, unfortunately we got to wrap up. So thank you everybody, Mark, Lewis, Anders, Ali, James, Andy, Gabby. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, thank you all. Thank so, you. Thanks all. Quick reminder, we'll have another session at 3 p.m. Pacific time where we'll go through and we'll talk to some more questions and, and you'll have a new set of hosts and we'll dig further into what's available in the CTF. Until then, good luck. Good luck. Good luck, everyone.